This is Thank You Mama Weekly Lessons for Mothers All Around the World. Hello and welcome to Thank You Mama. My name is Anna Tider. My guest today is Annie Everett. Annie is a Pacific Northwest native. She is a wife, a mother of three, and a small business owner. She owns a business called Teaching Hands. Annie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Anna. <laughs> Your podcast has been such a gift in my life, and especially at a time where we're not able to travel very much. I very much appreciate going around with the world with you weekly and, and just gleaning from some of the lessons of these amazing mothers around the world, yourself included. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying that, Annie. Now, Annie, let's share our little secret, which is that we are doing this for the second time. <laughs> we are. We thank are. Goodness. You were my very first guest and you and I attended our podcast course together. And then we we're like, mm -hmm. okay, we're starting a podcast. And I went and bought the microphone and you were my test bunny. We sat down and recorded my very first interview ever. Mm -hmm. And I was ready to go live with it a few weeks ago. And then I listened to it again and I was very torn between... Is it nice and special that it's the very first I ever recorded? Or is it not so nice and special? Because <laughs> A, I think I forgot to plug in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so the sound is not the very best. And B, I think we were both quite nervous. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't polished my interviewer skills out yet. So I listening to it, I was like, there's so much more to any that I want to talk about. Oh, oh, <laughs> and this you, is Anna. why... We are recording this again. Well, thank you for paving the way. I so appreciate it. You've done an incredible, incredible job with how far you've come. So thank you for paving the way for all of us potential creators out there as well. I'm excited <laughs> about your podcast one day. Thank you. Annie, tell me more about yourself and about your work and your life. Yeah, so... One lesson, actually, that I teach my own kids, just to circle back on what you just said, is it's so important to be willing to be novice in things, to be brand new and to try new things. So that's what we did when we did our first recording. And, and here we are um, this many weeks later and, and so much maturity and, and, and growth is happening. One COVID, one COVID and many, many months later. Yes. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Seriously. Um, so as you mentioned, I grew up here in the area. I'm a Seattle native. My mom, Grady, was as well. So that's a beautiful thing that we share. Uh, let's see. Before starting a family with my husband, Ed, I had a, I had a career in international business, which um, was also what I studied at the University of Washington. And what's interesting is through college, after college, through my the beginning of my career, I always found a way to teach or tutor or work with students. So at some point, the light bulb went on and I just thought to myself, I have been given a teacher's heart. I need to pursue this. Clearly, we pursue it daily when we're raising children. But Teaching Hands is the small business I created back in 2016. I created it as a way to properly teach rad kids, which is a um, which is an eight-hour course all about personal boundaries and safety for small children ages three to 13. So lo and behold, Teaching Hands was born 2016. And what I realize now is it's just a really good combination of those two things that I've pursued individually, both international business and then also teaching. So at this point, I do still teach rad kids, which is truly where my heart is at, um, teaching the next generation about how to protect, protect themselves and others. And then also as this pandemic has come about, it's been very interesting. I've had the opportunity to, spend up, to set up some small group in-person learning classes and just kind of meet that community need for our children to get together, be face-to-face -face with one another, of course, with face coverings and hand hygiene and all of those things that we will continue to hear about until this pandemic has its beautiful end. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's just, I really have appreciated the opportunity. My kids 
understand what mom's doing. They understand that it's important. And they just said, you know, mom, whatever you teach, just make it fun. <laughs> right? Like <laughs> The most like, important please, thing. Please just don't be boring. Right. Like just don't be boring. <laughs> like just be fun. So, you know, they're, they're my consultants. <laughs> <laughs> but any two extremely important things that you're te- doing. So Red Thank Kids, you. for me, when you first told me about it, I was not, I couldn't understand clearly what it was. But one summer you had a summer camp in your garden and you were teaching kids, Red Kids. And I was shocked because I was sitting here and working and suddenly a bunch of kids started saying, no, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> or go <Yep>. away. <laughs> Stay, and, stay back. You're not stay, my dad. <laughs> yeah, stay back. And I was so shocked and confused. I'm like, what, what is going on in Henny's garden? And and afterwards, we talked about what you really what what it really means. And it's so important. You are creating this awareness with children of what is appropriate and what not, and that they have the right to say, no, no, this is too Mm -hmm. close, physically too close, or this makes me feel uncomfortable, and Mm -hmm. how to report something that makes them feel uncomfortable and is inappropriate. It is so important, Annie. Thank you for doing it. Thank you. (laughs) Well, it's a fantastic organization, and it's truly been an honor to be a part of. Mm. And my own children have, have benefited, but it was very clear to me that when you receive a beautiful piece of information, it's your responsibility to keep sharing it with others. Mm -hmm. And when it becomes culture, that's when we'll see real change. You know, Mm -hmm. when, when children realize that it's up to them to both protect themselves and protect others, you know, our society could shift in a very positive way. Definitely. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. It's important to also to raise children with this awareness. Absolutely. And the other amazing thing is your teaching hands summer camps and maybe mm. even fall camps because we've been through this or we're still going through this uh, pandemic mm-hmm. and a lockdown. And you and I, I, I literally cried on your shoulder. I remember one morning <laughs> you rang my door and I came out and I was I broke down. I was in tears. I'm like, I cannot do this anymore we've been stuck in the house for four months at that time I think Mm -hmm. working cooking cleaning playing teaching and everything and I Mm -hmm. have one child at home you have three (laughs) well it's the same job description it's just a lot more laundry (laughs) and then the 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 fact that we were allowed to have this tiny Mm -hmm. little summer camps Mm -hmm. our lives have changed Kai's the happiest person in the world. Literally every day, I don't know if I told you, every day when I pick him up from the camp, he gets in the car and he says, Mama, this was the best day of my life. So it's amazing that you've created that for other kids this summer. But you also told me you're doing this for the fall, most probably. I think you're still in a planning stage. That's right, Anna. Because some schools will stay closed and Mm -hmm. parents are desperate. (laughs) And you, you will be their savior. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but, but, you know, you and I, we need to spread the good word that, that it, this all will be okay. You know, what we put together, it, everything is temporary and it's just hoping that children can thrive during this time too, that they can interact with one another safely and, you know, just kind of assuring parents, any chance I get, we just, I just try to assure parents that, this will, pandemics have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And let's just set something up with six weeks in mind or, you know, mm-hmm. three months mm-hmm. in mind. But we both know how rapidly things have shifted and they will start to do so again in a very positive way too. So mm-hmm. it's been really fun and rewarding to be able to to share that message and then just kind of evaluate how teaching hands can help in the meantime. You're doing a great job, Annie. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Thank sure you many, parents are so, <laughs> many parents and kids are so grateful. I appreciate but it. But before we go to Mama Grady, I wanted to talk a little bit about Seattle for, for yes. our international listeners, because when I tell people where Seattle is, they're like, really? Right. We are actually located very, very tucked in tightly to the left hand, upper left hand corner of the United States. I believe we're within an hour and a half drive from Vancouver. Yeah. 
So I don't know if we're welcome in Vancouver right now. But we're, <laughs> no, we're not. We're geographically <laughs> very close. So you know, and we are very far north. If you look at the northern hemisphere, it's amazing that uh, one fun fact about Seattle is in November you have your sun going down around 4, 4.30 by 5 o'clock, you're mm-hmm. dark. Whereas this time of year, especially June, July, you have these days, you're trying to get mm-hmm. these little people to sleep and it's mm-hmm. light and it's and light it's and maybe 9 o'clock, <laughs> 9.30 and they're just looking at you like, yeah, I don't mm-hmm. think so. You know, <laughs> sun's awake, I'm awake. And another fun fact is that it's raining so much here and it really is <laughs> that... Mm-hmm. There, we have the only temperate rainforest in the world. Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that. This is why we're like going hiking in these gorgeous woods. Yes. But let's go back to Mama Grady. Mama Grady is also from here, as we heard. Yes. In fact, she grew up on Mercer Island, as did I. And Mercer Island is a beautiful place covered in trees island, even more so when she was young. Uh, It was known as East Seattle. You could access it by ferry only. And uh, yeah, it was known for horseback riding and just a place to go and kind of retreat from the city. Yeah, that's where Mama Grady grew up. She actually um, left Mercer Island. She got her bachelor's in education at CU Boulder, which is University of Colorado. She met my dad at the Air Force Academy at the time, and they got married, I believe, within a month of graduation, so in 1970. He was a pilot, and he was assigned to um, fly for the Air Force in the Vietnam War. My mom spent 15 months during that time living in Taiwan while he was flying, so he went back and forth between Vietnam, between serving in the war and checking in with her in Taiwan. They were only 24 years old at the time, if you can believe it. And it really broadened her horizons. It broadened her perspective. And she went back. She got her PhD in, um, in oh my gosh. Political science. Thank you. She got her PhD <laughs> in political science with a focus in international relations for that reason. And she got that PhD when my brother and I were both quite young. So, you know, no pressure. <laughs> Last time we did this interview, we talked about the graduation when she, yes. there are pictures of her in her gown yes. with her PhD, what is it called? Diploma? Holding one of you as a baby. Yes. Yeah. I believe I was on her hip and my brother was next to her. And, you know, in terms of big f- shoes to fill, <laughs> I, I would say that that definitely set the tone for, yeah, you know, just a, she's just a lovely, educated, bright, strong woman. And that that presence has been very strong, both in my life and the life of my children. So, Annie, when you went to high school, your mom and dad divorced. They did. And they always stayed very unified on the parenting front. And for that, my teachers, our community, they all um, really commended them for how lockstep they stayed. They would attend curriculum nights together. Um, So you know, it was very unfortunate. It's unfortunate for any marriage to end, but they did Mm -hmm. a great job staying unified. And um, to this day, many, many years later, they still bring their, you know, they put their heads together if anything's going on with either my brother or myself. And uh, for that, I'm very grateful. Now, I leaped into it too fast. Before that, I Mm -hmm. wanted to mention that while you were little, she was working as a marketing executive Full time, mm-hmm. always. She had three kids. Yes, two. And she two. It probably she, felt like three. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked. And when I heard this, I, I asked you, "How did she manage?" You said she had help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When my brother and I were elementary aged, we had a helper who would pick us up from school around three ish, and that person would be responsible for making dinner. And my parents were home by gosh, and sometime between six and seven. And they both valued sitting at the table and eating together. It mm-hmm. just wasn't necessarily them that had done the preparation. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I always want to stress that women should get help where, when possible. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> One of the biggest lessons I learned from my beloved editor of Vienna Review, which the first newspaper I used to lo- uh, write for, 
I, I asked her about this, having two children and a career, and she said the the key is to learn how to delegate. And that mm. seems so easy, but it's so hard. It <laughs> is. It is. And, mm. and we all have a sense of pride around being a mom or being a wife, taking care of our homes. And I think sometimes you just have to kind of get your pride in check and say, I truly can't do everything. Mm. So which things can I hand over to another lovely human and and then be able to do my kind of primary aim things that much better. So after the divorce, mm -hmm. Grady did a courageous thing, which is she started her own business. She did, yes. And she, up to this day, she still actually receives clients and it's basically based on human resources. So when the economy is strong, she has done, done recruiting and team building When the economy is weak, she has done layoff services and, you know, she's been, she has stayed with what the market has needed as, and has been able to, to do that for, I want to say 30 years. So yeah, she did that. <laughs> wow. So she's still not retired. How old is she? She is 71, I want to say, and um, she has a lovely boss. She's self-employed, and uh, <laughs> she she takes on projects that seem like a good fit. It's it's by no means full-time. It's consultant-based work, so she can scale it based on um, her, her time and energy levels, and it does work well for her. It does. It's beautiful to hear that you can continue working in your 70s. Yes, absolutely. It keeps, it keeps people young. That's why mm -hmm. she looks so young. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Any, let's learn from her. Yes. Oh, well, <laughs> I really, I loved reading through these again today. Um, the first one is, we called it not falling in love with the mirror. And just to give some context to that, when I was a very little girl, maybe four or five, six years old, She pulled me aside and it was a very loving tone that she used. It almost felt like it was our secret. You know, she said, Annie, you're, you're a very beautiful girl on the inside and out, you know, a message that we should give every daughter. And she just said, just know that you're beautiful on the inside and out and, and that really what matters the most is the content of your heart. So put your hair up in a ponytail and go and live your life and just know that you're a very beautiful girl. And I loved that because I remember kind of just sauntering away, feeling so big and feeling so loved. And, and it was a big deal to me, but it was also very clear that beauty, external beauty is not the focus, right? Mm -hmm. It was not the focus. It was just tuck that in your back pocket, Annie, and put your hair up in a ponytail, go play your basketball games and mm -hmm. live your life and focus on the matter of the heart because that's... That's where true beauty lies. And, you know, certainly into adulthood, we start to realize that more and more. And I'm grateful to her that she planted that seed with me at such a young age. Are you doing this with your girls? I hope so. I mean, <laughs> you know, I think definitely through, through role modeling. I mean, I always try to put my best foot forward. Both you and I have had this conversation so many times of, Put your best foot forward. A little bit of mascara, a little bit of lip gloss goes a long way. But they see me just out there living my life and serving others, serving the community. And, you know, the lesson of just don't fall in love with the mirror because it can't love you back is one that mm -hmm. I don't feel like I've set them down and had the exact same conversation. But I do think that we live it in the way that we relate with one another and where we put our priorities, I guess. Mm -hmm. But let's go to kindness. You just mentioned matters of the heart and serving the community. Mm -hmm. I love the second lesson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Mama Grady, she's always taught me about the importance of kindness. And clearly it's something she taught my brother too, because the first day of high school, my brother pulled me aside. He was a senior and he said, Annie, you know, you don't know what people are going through here. And, and it doesn't matter if they're cool or not cool or part of this group or that group. He said, you know, it's in your best interest to always be kind to everyone. And so coming from a 17 year old big brother, <laughs> you know, I thought, Oh, that's going to file that one away. And um, my mom created a nonprofit, which I just think is so cool. It's, it's called angel packs And the whole heart and intention behind it is to serve the homeless children in our area. 
believe it or not, Anna, we have 40,000 students in our state who are registering for public school education without a permanent home address. That is so sad. Yeah. That is heartbreaking. That statistic, if you really allow it to sink in, is is very heavy. And in the same time, we are at home to Microsoft, Boeing, yes. Starbucks, mm, who else? Expedia. Google, Expedia, all mm -hmm. these very successful and rich mm -hmm. companies, right. richest people in the universe live here close to us, Bill yes. Gates and Bezos. Do you know what's amazing, Anna, is our area is one of the most kind of socioeconomically diverse area areas on the east side. And You know, I, I love feeling that diversity, um, both culturally here in the area, but also just being right here in the heart of there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunity to serve right here in our Lake Hills community. Um, and so my mom's nonprofit, Angel Packs, it deals with the children because there there's you can't really politicize how children get involved in homelessness. There's no no child that's at mm -hmm. fault for the circumstance that they've been born into. So we provide backpacks and school supplies. And in the winter, we have provided um, all-weather shirts and pants, things that they can wear under their clothing for school. And generally, they've been very well received. And it's it's just a simple, straightforward way that my mom has chosen to be involved and give back to the community. And she's involved my children. And so three generations strong, we've gone to the emergency weather shelters and handed out supplies. And that kindness goes beyond words and prayers. She is a woman of strong faith. Her faith is being demonstrated in this way in actions versus, you know, simply in prayers or words alone. Any, I mentioned this in the first interview. I want to, and I want to say it again that the, this inherited kindness is very strong with you. I think you must be one of the kindest persons I ever met in my life. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> you are one of the sweetest, kindest, always there, whatever you need, always a kind word, helpful. You are very precious. Thank you for being my neighbor. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, I don't know if my husband would agree <laughs> with the things that you said, because but trust me, you know, we can all just be awful at times. But I, I do believe that this lesson has sunk in. And when we're looking out for one another, it makes a neighborhood so strong. When we're looking out for one another, it makes a community so strong. So you are very much a part of that, too, my friend. And, you know, Well, you can tell when somebody is focused on kindness, you feel it, you just feel as though you matter and that that person is caring and investing in you. And that's the kindest mm. thing we can give to one another. Any, we have another beautiful one. This one is so fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have to just take a minute and describe my grandfather. He was this super sharp, bright orthodontist by trade, artist by passion. And he always, he studied James Joyce. He studied Shakespeare. He just was a wonderfully quirky, eccentric guy. And we adored him. And one of the lessons that he taught my mother that she needed to in turn teach me came from her own time in university. She had to call him and say, dad, oh my gosh, I think I'm going to fail this class. I just, I can't even wrap my head around this um, content. And he said, Grady, if you're going to fail, fail with pride. You just take your test, your exam, you walk to the front of the room, like you've aced it, you set it down, you walk away and hold your head up high and just <laughs> fail with pride and fail with flair. And so what was just a very fun anecdotal story as a child, unfortunately, <laughs> became reality for me. I was studying abroad. I was not studying nearly as much as I needed to be. This particular course was an evening course. And let's just say I had a lot of extracurricular activities in the evenings. And, you know, it just, it, I try, I really tried to make that class a priority, but I was young and somewhat foolish. And I was proud of myself to making it for making it to this class one night. And I realized the doors were closing. Everybody had two number two pencils and blank paper. 
And I realized that the evening that I chose to attend was an exam. Oh. And I sat there, <laughs> my hands were sweating. I just, you know, I'm just looking around, you know, like a trapped fox, like how do I get out of this situation? <laughs> and I remembered my grandfather and, and the story that my mom really enjoyed sharing with my brother and I, if you're going to fail, fail with pride and fail with some flair. So you better believe I did the best I could on that test. But my gosh, I truly (laughs) had to hold my head up high, walk to the front of the class and turn my exam in and fail with pride. And I'm pretty (laughs) certain that's exactly what I did that day. It reminds me of one of the the hardest exams I ever took. And I forgot now, which it was... I think it was advanced corporate finance Mm. or some kind of advanced accounting, something with numbers because me and numbers are not. Well, any of us makes my hands (laughs) wet just hearing it. So I remember I sat down and I read the questions and I literally felt dizzy. I seriously thought I'm going to faint. I'm going to throw up or pass (laughs) out. (laughs) I believe it. And, And, you know, what if we can share this lesson with our own children? before it happens to them. And yeah. just circling back to we said to what we said at the beginning, you have to be willing to be novice at things in your life. And you have to be willing to fail, right? It's going to mm-hmm. happen. Mm-hmm. And know that it's going to be okay. That's you know, right. you fail and then you we do are. it again and you're, you're, you're fine. It's good. I, I got my MBA at the end. I did it. I failed it that one well. time, but... <laughs> That's right. And I did... I did come back from Spain and unfortunately the transcript was a direct grade for grade. So on my University of Washington transcript, I have everything from a 4.0 to a 0.0 represented. <laughs> it's there. Great diversity. Yeah. <laughs> Annie, we learned very beautiful lessons from Mama Grady. What was or was there anything she did not teach you? Something that you had to learn yourself? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that both my parents had very robust careers. My dad was an attorney. He became an attorney after he graduated from the Air Force Academy. So one thing that I did not pick up was just sitting in the kitchen, like watching my mom cook every night, right? That was just, (laughs) it wasn't happening. And I remember, I remember at my uh, swim team events or things like that, they would always show up, but they would show up dressed professionally because they were coming straight from their professional days. And I never, I never felt a sense of anything other than proud of them. And, you know, like impressed, like, oh, those are my parents. Like they're, they have their own careers and yet there they are. They're my biggest fans as well. So Did I learn to cook from Mama Grady? No. And I don't think that she will be offended to hear me say that. I've filled in the gaps as a grown up and, you know, I've had a lot of fun in the kitchen, but it's just not something that I picked up as a child at all. This is what you and I have in common because I had a mom with two careers who yeah, who didn't really have a passion for cooking. So it's it's fun talking to you about things where you and I are both learning and discovering now in the kitchen. Yes. And I, I loved listening to the episode about your mama and I can't wait to read the book about your mama because of course she didn't have time to cook. Are you kidding me? She was an (laughs) actress. She was a painter. Didn't you say at one point she was hanging paintings and the paint was still drying? (laughs) But not at one point, you know how often she was doing everything in the last moment. (laughs) I love that. I'm sorry, but that is just interesting <laughs> stuff, you know? So she didn't make a nice strudel, like she's forgiven. You know? oh, oh, this is funny you say this because the one thing she did love making and was fantastic and is strudel. Oh, oh. well, <laughs> you're welcome. You're good. That it's was her funny. go-to. I love that. <laughs> Meant to be. Yeah. Annie, thank you so much for being my guest again and yes. sharing these beautiful lessons from Mama Grady. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for all the times that you have mothered me. They matter. You've always made me feel very special and cared for. And, you know, as women, we mother one another. And I did not mean for that to rhyme, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it's just, it's such an inspiring, uplifting thing. And I love what you're doing. Please, please keep them coming. Thank you, Annie. If you enjoy Thank You, Mama and want to help it grow, please take the two seconds to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. 
If you'd like to get in touch, you can send me a mail at info at thankyoumama.net. You can also find me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter under Anna Tider, that's T-A-J-D-E-R. This was Thank You Mama. Come back next week, subscribe and tell your friends. Bye.